Okay, make your way to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And we're looking at the parables of the kingdom that Jesus gave in Matthew 13. Last week we looked at the parable that we call the sower, the seed, and the soils. This week we're going to look at the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds. I've titled this teaching, The World's Greatest Counterfeiting Scheme. The World's Greatest Counterfeiting Scheme. In Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 24, Jesus states the parable. And then in verses 37 through 40, he explains it. So there's two of these parables. We don't have to wonder about what they mean, Jesus tells us. But let's, let, let me take time to read verses 24 through 30 and follow with me. I'm reading from the New American Standard. <clears throat> Jesus presented another parable to them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the, land, of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Like I said, I'm talking about the world's greatest counterfeiting scheme. This counterfeiting ring has been, op been in operation for centuries in our world. The gang of thieves work secretly and very successfully. Their product isn't counterfeit money, but counterfeit men. The master imitators and counterfeiters are Satan and his demons. Satan's design is to demonstrate Listen closely, that you can be good without God, that you can act like God without acknowledging the true God. You see, Satan's goal is not to, to produce a bunch of drunks and drug addicts and uh, down and outers. That's not his ideal. His ideal is to have a person look as much like God as possible without, without trusting in God, without obeying God, without submitting to God. So his goal is, is to mix weeds amid the wheat in an attempt to corrupt God's harvest and choke out His work. So in this parable, we have two planters. Two planters. Who, who are the planters? Jesus and Satan. We have two plants. What are the plants? Wheat and tares. We have two plans. One is for a successful wheat harvest. The other is to corrupt it, to poison it. We have two prospects or two outcomes, two expectations. But before I jump in and, and um, open up this parable and uh, uh, begin to unpack it, I, I, we need to understand exactly what a parable is. A parable, is, the word actually means to throw alongside of. It's not an allegory. It's not something that's meant to be taken apart and a half a dozen points made from the parable. A, a normal parable is a simple story using specific imagery to make a single point. Be, be careful, make sure you hear that. To make a single point, almost every parable, the whole purpose is to make one single point. Now, with that in mind, what's the point of the parable of the wheat and the weeds? And, it, and it's simply this, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or the heavens, the word is actually plural, plural, contains a mixture in which wheat and weeds grow together side by side and you can't always tell them apart. But before going any, other, any further, let, let me open up just a little bit further and give you three 
uh, implications of this parable of the wheat and the weeds. There are basically three things you need to know. One, in Jesus' day, sowing weeds in a neighbor's field was a common way that, that people had of getting even with each other. Instead of spraying graffiti on the walls or egging their chariots <laughs> or rolling their yard with toilet paper, they, they sowed weed seed in the neighbor's crops, and that's cruel. In fact, it became such a common practice that the Romans made it against the law, punishable. And secondly, the seed spoken of in the parable of the wheat and the tares is called bearded darnel. It was a variety of ryegrass, and in the early stages of growth, it was indistinguishable from wheat. And then thirdly, the seeds of the bearded darnel were poisonous. The name actually comes from the French word darne, which means stupefied. The symptoms of eating darnel were dizziness, slurred speech, vomiting, and diarrhea. In other words, it was bad stuff. So if it was allowed to grow up and be harvested with the wheat and ground up, then it corrupted, poisoned the whole thing. So in order that his disciples might not be frustrated and defeated by Satan's tactics, Jesus shares this parable of the wheat and the weeds. Now remember, when the New Testament church is starting, when the kingdom is being initiated by Jesus, there's only a handful of people. And that handful of people runs a risk, at least in their opinion, of being overrun by the tares, by the weeds. So it's for that reason that he gives these parables. And the primary message is this. Get a note back there, my brother. Um, the primary message is this. Expect opposition from the enemy. Don't be naive. Don't think you're going to be carried to the sky on flowery beds of ease while others have fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. Expect opposition from the enemy, especially in these two forms infiltration and imitation. Let me repeat that. Infiltration and imitation. But here's the counsel. Don't spend your life trying to spot and remove the counterfeits. I'm told by those that are involved in spotting counterfeit bills in America that they spend their time not studying counterfeits, but studying the real thing. Keep focusing on the real thing so that when counterfeits appear, you can spot them. But it's not that easy in the spiritual realm to, to spot uh, 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 someone that would be called a, a tear or, or weed. So here's what you need to remind yourself of daily. That God has purposed a gigantic harvest and no schemes of the enemy can produce crop failure. In this confidence, you need to determine to go on sowing more gospel seed than ever because we're going to learn from the, as we learn from the parable of the sower, the seed, and the soils, there will ultimately be a bumper crop, a big crop. So after his disciples ask for an explanation of the meaning of the wheat and the weeds, Jesus explained to them in Matthew 13, verses 37 through 40, the meaning of this parable. So drop down, look at that uh, in your Bibles. And notice, number one, who is the sower of the good seed? Uh, are you looking? The son of man. Jesus. Jesus is a sower of good seed. Uh, who, who is the good seed? Sons of the, kingdom. the sons of the kingdom. In other words, they're believers. The field is what? The world. The weeds are those who do not belong to the kingdom. The sower of the weeds is whom? The devil. Who are the reapers? The angels. Good, Ann. Move to the front of the class. You're good. I taught her well. That's my wife They're giving all those brilliant answers. <laughs> all right, so let's, let's begin to unpack it now. The planted field is one of wheat and not weeds. 
Wheat is representative of the true born-again citizen of the kingdom of heaven. The weeds represent the counterfeit kingdom citizens of the world's of the world system sown by the enemy of King Jesus, the devil. Again, Matthew 13, 38, the field is the world, the good seeds, the sons of the kingdom, the weeds are the sons of the evil one. So again, if you're not careful, you'll misinterpret this parable. It's a parable of the kingdom of the heavens or the kingdom of God. And we've got to have a clear understanding that the church is not the kingdom. But instead, it is in the kingdom and has the task of serving as chief ambassadors of the kingdom. Two big prepositions. The church is in the kingdom, but is not the kingdom. And it is an ambassador of the kingdom. So we're given an assignment to represent the interest of our king by making the invisible kingdom of God, which is spiritual, spiritual, making it visible and material through faithful obedience to our king by proclaiming and demonstrating the message of the kingdom. 2 Corinthians 5.20, great verse. Now then we are ambassadors of Christ, ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So this is not a parable that teaches the church is going to be filled with a bunch of weeds and there's no need for church discipline to be exercised because Jesus said, let them grow together until the end of the age. That's not what this parable is about. Jesus, in his interpretation of the parable, tells us plainly that the field is the world and not the church. What, what difference does this detail make? By attempting to make the field the world and not the church, this means that we're not to uproot people, we're not to be judgmental in our evangelism, or attempt to use the strong arm of civil government to uproot and burn those that we consider heretics. And unfortunately, the church has done that in the past. But Jesus said, no, this is not the way we're to approach this. And it doesn't mean that we're to tolerate false teaching in the church. The Bible is full of admonitions to be warned about those kind of people and to remove them. Because if the enemy is allowed to penetrate the body of the church and, and, and go undetected, eventually it'll, it would fester and destroy the church. And that's not going to happen because it's not our church. Jesus said, it's my church. And upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So we, as sons of the kingdom, are not to conclude at any juncture of history that those who are against us as Christians are more than those that are with us and will eventually overtake us, choke us out. Uh, we'll be choked out by evil men and religious counterfeits unless Jesus comes and raptures us off the earth. That is not, in my humble and normally accurate opinion, what the Bible teaches. If you believe that, fine, no problem. You can be wrong. You have every right to be wrong. I'm just kidding. I don't mean to be like I am, but I am what I am. Sandy's laughing because she knows <laughs> deep down that's the way I feel. I repent. <laughs> Sackcloth and ashes, <laughs> at least for a while. <laughs> so to do so is to discount the presence and the power and the promises and purpose of God. It's to lose sight of the reality. Listen, that Jesus planted a field of wheat and an enemy sowed some weeds amid the field of wheat. Yeah. It is a wheat field, not a weed field. That's good. That's good. <laughs> and the challenge for us is to live by faith in God's word and not by what we can see or sense with our eyes and ears. Our problem is we see the darkness of the devil and the weeds more clearly than we see the risen triumphant Lord Jesus and his wheat. It's hard to comprehend the reality of the presence of the kingdom of God when the kingdom of darkness is, so, is obviously present. We look at the weeds more than the wheat and conclude that the weeds will ultimately take over. And if you listen to, to the news, almost any kind of news, 
then you come away that the world is going to hell in a handbasket and nothing good is happening. But let me tell you, good news never sails. The reason there's bad news isn't because the world is so bad. It's because people don't want to watch good That's news. Right. For every story of good of bad news given, there could be 10 stories of good news given. For every bad incident in Augusta, Georgia, you can find hundreds of good incidents that never make the news. So if you're not careful, you'll, you'll come to a wrong conclusion by simply watching and listening to what, what, what's most prominently uh, put before you. We hear from the pulpits and read in the books about Islam being on the march. The governments are plotting and planning to unify under one world government. False religions are multiplying and wickedness is abounding on every street corner. This tends to cause us to believe that the wheat field has become a weed field and we can only at best be weed watchers. A few want to be weed whackers, but we are not called to be weed watchers nor weed whackers. It is a field of yeah. wheat. Amen. A field of wheat. And there's going to be a harvest because the Lord of the harvest has promised so. Listen to me closely and carefully if you don't hear anything else. The gospel is more powerful than the devil's lie in history. Amen. It's more powerful. Here's the second big idea. We are to believe in the presence, power, and progress of the kingdom despite the continuing pervasive influence of evil. We must not form a pessimistic view of the kingdom from the fact that evil continues to exist and grow. When Jesus told this parable of the wheat and the weeds, one of the points that he sought to make was that the coming of the kingdom does not mean the immediate destruction of evil. In fact, this present age is characterized by the growth of both good and evil as Jesus said it would be. So people often ask me, do you think things are getting worse or things are getting better? And my answer is yes. Yes. Things are getting worse. Yes, things are getting better. Both grow together. That's what Jesus said. They'll both grow together until the end of the age. Now, this was very strategic uh, especially at the beginning of, of the New Testament uh, uh, kingdom and uh, implication of the kingdom and the church's extension of that. The fact that the kingdom coexists with this present evil age and will ultimately outlove, outlast, and defeat it. All right, here's the next big idea. C, frustration with the continuing presence of evil should not cause us to conclude that the kingdom of heaven has not come. The kingdom of heaven has been definitively established at the first coming of Christ. It is being progressively extended since that time and will ultimately be victorious and be established and embraced by all the nations. Its establishment and extension is not dependent upon the prior destruction of evil. Within the world, believers and unbelievers continue to exist side by side, even after the proclamation of the kingdom of heaven and Jesus' assault on the kingdom of Satan. Now, again, this was a, this was a problem for, for the uh, disciples, especially uh, uh, John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist is in prison, and he was, he'd been proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand. Jesus is has come on the scene. He believes that Jesus is that king whose kingdom is coming. But, but he sent some of his disciples to ask Jesus, uh, are, are you the one? Are, are you the Messiah? Are you the Yeshua HaMashiach, the promised Old Testament king, Messiah? Or do we look for another? Why was he asking that? Because he knew he, he was going to lose his head at any given time. He knew evil was still abounding. And that Jewish concept at that time was when the king is a kingdom comes and the king comes to establish that kingdom, then he'll slice and dice and smash and get rid of all evil and set his kingdom up. Mm -hmm. And that didn't happen. So they concluded and John was, pro uh, he was perplexed. Uh, are you the one or do we look for another? And Jesus gave these parables and said, look, evil is going to continue all the way to the end of the age. 
It, but it's not going to overcome the wheat. It's not going to overcome my kingdom. So, uh, it, this will be a stumbling block unless we, we get this clearly uh, in our minds and settled in our hearts. All right, look at something else. The emphasis of the parable is on the certainty of the harvest and not on the growth of evil. We live in the present mixture of weeds alongside the wheat without pessimism. Where evil is growing like weeds in the field is also under the control of the Lord of the harvest. The parable teaches that it's a mistake to magnify the presence and propagation of sinfulness and expect it to overcome and choke out the kingdom of heaven. It's not going to happen. And then the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ will be accomplished. Uh, verse 30, he says, Allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, now listen how he answers, gives a, a, a explanation of this. Verse 40, look at verse 40. So just as the tares, well, let me back up a verse. Verse 39, the enemy who sowed them is the devil and the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. So the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ will be accomplished. Notice the twofold aspects of this purpose being accomplished. Number one, the wheat make it to the barn. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. The wheat make it to the barn. They don't get lost on the way. They make it to the barn. But gather the wheat into my barn. Who, who's the wheat? The sons of the kingdom the sons of light, the regenerate sons of God. So it is his wheat field and it's going to grow large and loaded down with wheat for harvest. Now you, you would never know it by what you see and hear for the most part. And even what a lot of preachers preach, gloom and doom. But the, but the kingdom of God is being extended now in unprecedented ways Amen. like never before i'm going to talk about that next week do you know where the fastest growing church in the world is that's exactly right in iran the fastest growing church in the world right now is in iran you don't hear about that you're never going to hear about that we'll talk about china next week the chinese leaders the communist leaders are 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 are, they're maybe not shaking in their boots, but they should be. They're greatly concerned. I read an article last week. They are anticipating that by 2030. Now that sounds like space odyssey or something. 2030. You know how long that is? Nine, years. nine short years. Nine short years. In nine, by 2030, the Chinese are expecting the church to have reached 300 million in number. That's the underground church. Conservative estimates today is that the church is around 100 million. And they're going to make a difference. And they're not going to make a difference by violent overthrow. It's, it's, it's like we'll see next week. It's the, it's the mustard seed and the yeast that's been planted. Okay, so Jesus sowed good seed and he'll have his barn filled with it at the last. So listen, brothers and sisters, do not become discouraged and depressed or feel like the defeat of the purpose of God are imminent due to the presence or even the proliferation of evil in the world. 
Jesus Christ will not be disappointed. The scriptures declare he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. In the words of the psalmist, he has gone forth weeping, bearing precious seed, but he shall come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Gather the wheat into my barn, says King Jesus. Considering this statement, we can live in the confidence that Satan's policy will be unsuccessful. The enemy came and sowed tares or weeds among the wheat, hopeful that the false wheat would destroy or materially injure the truth. But he failed in the end, for the wheat ripened and was ready to be gathered. Uh, Christ's harvest shall be very fruitful and his barn shall be filled. The weeds of wickedness will not choke the wheat of righteousness. The evil one will be put to shame. Remember again, I want to say it again, you are to be a wheat watcher and not a weed watcher. We tend to, we, we, talk, we, we talk all the time about how, how the weeds are growing, how wicked the weeds are, how poisonous the weeds are. Get focused on and find the information on the wheat, yeah. on the people of God, on the extension of the kingdom of God. The, 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 uh, I already told you, don't try to be a weed whacker, a weed puller upper. <laughs> The Lord of the harvest is expecting a bumper crop from every tongue and tribe on this earth, and he will not experience a massive crop failure due to the presence of the weeds. Listen to this passage, Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no man could number. Let me repeat that. A great multitude that no man could number from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands crying out with a loud voice salvation belongs to our god who sits on the throne and to the lamb how big is the harvest a great multitude that no man can number one place they referred to as the sand of the sea in number now, if you're thinking in terms of just me, my wife, John, his wife, us four, no more, get over it. No wonder you're defeated, dejected, and depressed by looking at the weeds. Stop looking at the weeds and start looking at the wheat. Amen. 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 Uh, the, wheat, the wheat make it to the barn, but notice, secondly, the weeds will be burned. I read that in verse 30 and verses 40 through 43. So the explanation given in these verses rightly focuses not on the present unsatisfactory situation, but on the judgment of the world at the end of the age when the wicked will be destroyed and the righteous will shine out for all to see. So also we're going, before we finish the study in Matthew 13, uh, we'll look in verses 47 through 50 at the parable of the dragnet. And when you combine the parable of the wheat and the tares, and the parable of the dragnet, you have uh, the most explicit detailed accounts of final judgment and the ultimate fates of the bad and the good that you find anywhere in the Gospels. Notice, and they shall be cast into a furnace of fire. Not, not a material furnace. It's metaphorical. It denotes the wrath of God, <clears throat> which shall fall upon wicked men and abide upon them to all eternity. We refer, or the Bible refers to this as hell fire. Sometimes it refers to it as a lake which burns with fire and brimstone. <clears throat> and here, a furnace of fire. And what that expresses is the vehemency and intenseness of divine wrath, which will be intolerable. In, in furnace of fire, i.e. hell, the unbeliever's capacity is not diminished. You don't hear much about hell anymore. It's not very popular. You hear it far more just as a, as a curse word, a byword. Isn't it strange we use that? We don't say, well, what the heaven? <laughs> Why, heaven, no. It's just strange the way we use that word. It's like if we make light of it, it diminishes the reality of it. But Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. 
and in hell, the unbeliever's capacity is not diminished. In fact, it's anticipated and intensified. His capacity for loving something is still there, but there's nothing to love. For trusting something is still there. So there's nothing to love but God, and he has no heart for God. There's nothing to think on but God, and this is caused his terror and torment to his soul. There's no relief from God. There's none from his conscience because it only accuses him. There's none from the devil and none from the damned and none from the demons. And listen closely. It's, 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 it's Dante, it's poetic to say that the devil rules in hell. He doesn't rule in hell. In fact, he's never been to hell. He's going to hell. His residence is not hell. He's headed for there, but he's not there now. He doesn't rule out of hell. He's going to be cast ultimately into the lake of fire to be forever separated from God in a place under the wrath of God. So uh, this idea that you're going to go and have a grand old time in hell celebrating with others who've gone to hell and uh, then you'll uh, uh, be under the rulership of the devil that's devil in itself, not scripture. So there's, there's no relief. There's no hope. It's gone forever. There's no, no relief from time because this state is forever. Hell is that place where there's no music, but the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's no drink, but from the cup of the fury and indignation of God's wrath. There's no light, only the blackness of outer darkness forever so and that's for that reason it's incumbent upon us to be good seed sowers get the seed out get the seed out now i want to sum up by making three applications from our lord's story in this parable number one stay in business say that with me stay, stay in, in business, business. Jesus said in Luke 19, 13, do business. King James says occupy. It means to do business. Do business till I come. <laughs> we can't do business if we're planning on going out of business any minute. Rulers don't rule and runners don't. Uh, let me say it again. Runners don't rule and rulers don't run. Don't be on an agenda of withdrawal from the world. There are no ideal spots in this world. World, Wherever Christ sows his people, Satan sows his seeds. So bloom where you're planted. Augustine said, those who are weeds today may be wheat tomorrow. Amen. Be careful about concluding the way you see somebody that all they are is weeds. You don't know that. I looked in all, I, I, I don't want to mix metaphors and analogies and so on, um, but, but I, I was weed, bad weed. But, but God planted and got wheat. <laughs> I, I, and like I said, I don't, want, I don't want to get into that. I mean, we could go even further and talk about sheep become, goat becoming sheep, and et cetera. But that, that's another subject altogether. Stay in business. Dennis Peacock said, we're the only team that he ever played for that roots for the other side to win so we can get off the field. <laughs> well, let me run that by you again. He said, we're the only team that I've ever played for that roots for the other team to win. The quicker they win, the quicker we get off the field. In other words, the quicker, the quicker they fry in hell, the, the quicker we fly away. <laughs> Stay in business. Don't look at the signs of the times or how late it is. You want to know how late it is? Look at the clock. Look at the calendar. It's late for me and some others in the room. And it may be late for you, pretty gal. You don't know what the time is. So stay in business. Don't plan on going out of business. I used to have people, they say, oh, Lord, I'd hate to bring children into this world. That's the reason it's in the fix it's in now. Nobody, everybody wants to retreat. We've been eating, meeting, and retreating for too long. It's time to snack, pack, and attack. <laughs> with the truth of God, the word of God, the love of God. I'm not talking about with a material weapons. So stay in business. Number two, practice forbearance. Let both grow together. Jesus said let both grow together. This is a synonym for forbearance. 
and, uh, or this is, this means forbearance and a synonym for forbearance is tolerance. We used to be a relatively tolerant people, but now tolerance means that you, you believe what I believe and that only uh, in other, and if you don't, then you're intolerant. You're a bigot. You're an Islamophobic. You're a homophobic. You're xenophobic. You're whatever phobic. Let them, let them uh, practice forbearance. Practice for always remember the mission of the church is sowing seeds, developing wheat and not pulling weeds. <clears throat> and then last of all, anticipate the harvest. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. God will harvest the wheat. He'll bring his people home and the righteous will shine like the sun. So the question is, with whom will you be bundled on that day? May we be found in the bundle of life with the people of God who submit their lives to King Jesus and stand before Father in the grace that they find in Him and in Him alone. Amen? Amen.